September 25th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Jeremiah chapters 3 and 4 from the Old Testament. If a man divorces his wife and she leaves him and becomes another man's wife, he may not take her back again. Doing that would utterly defile the land. But you, Israel, have given yourself as a prostitute to many gods. So what makes you think you can return to me? says the Lord. Look up at the hilltops and consider this. You have had sex with other gods on every one of them. You waited for those gods like a thief lying in wait in the desert. You defiled the land by your wicked prostitution to other gods. That is why the rains have been withheld and the spring rains have not come. Yet in spite of this you are obstinate as a prostitute. You refuse to be ashamed of what you have done. Even now you say to me, you are my father. You have been my faithful companion ever since I was young. You will not always be angry with me, will you? You will not be mad at me forever, will you? This is what you say, but you continually do all the evil that you can. When Josiah was king of Judah, the Lord said to me, Jeremiah, you have no doubt seen what wayward Israel has done. You have seen how she got up to every high hill and under every green tree to give herself like a prostitute to other gods. Yet even after she had done all that, I thought that she might come back to me, but she did not. Her sister unfaithful Judah saw what she did. She also saw that I gave wayward Israel her divorce papers and sent her away because of her adulterous worship of other gods. Even after her unfaithful sister Judah had seen this, she still was not afraid, and she too went and gave herself like a prostitute to other gods. Because she took her prostitution so lightly, she defiled the land through her adulterous worship of gods made of wood and stone. In spite of all this, Israel's sister, unfaithful Judah, has not turned back to me with any sincerity. She has only pretended to do so, says the Lord. Then the Lord said to me, Under the circumstances, wayward Israel could even be considered less guilty than unfaithful Judah. Go and shout this message to my people in the countries in the north. Tell them, Come back to me, wayward Israel, says the Lord. I will not continue to look on you with displeasure, for I am merciful, says the Lord. I will not be angry with you forever. However, you must confess that you have done wrong and that you have rebelled against the Lord your God. You must confess that you have given yourself to foreign gods under every green tree and have not obeyed my commands. Come back to me, my wayward son, says the Lord, for I am your true master. If you do, I will take one of you from each town and two of you from each family group, and I will bring you back to Zion. I will give you leaders who will be faithful to me. They will lead you with knowledge and insight. In those days, your population will greatly increase in the land. At that time, says the Lord, people will no longer talk about having the ark that contains the Lord's covenant with us. They will not call it to mind, remember it, or miss it. No, that will not be done anymore. At that time, the city of Jerusalem will be called the Lord's throne. All nations will gather there in Jerusalem to honor the Lord's name. They will no longer follow the stubborn inclinations of their own evil hearts. At that time, the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel will be reunited. Together they will come back from a land in the north to the land that I gave to your ancestors as a permanent possession. I thought to myself, oh, what a joy it would be for me to treat you like a son. What a joy it would be for me to give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful piece of property there is in all the world. I thought you would call me father, and you would never cease being loyal to me. But you have been unfaithful to me, nation of Israel, like an unfaithful wife who has left her husband, says the Lord. A noise is heard on the hilltops. It is the sound of the people of Israel crying and pleading to their gods. Indeed, they have followed sinful ways. They have forgotten to be true to the Lord their God. Come back to me, you wayward people. I want to cure your waywardness. Say, here we are. We come to you because you are the Lord our God. 
We know our noisy worship of false gods on the hills and mountains did not help us. We know that the Lord, our God, is the only one who can deliver Israel. From earliest times, our worship of that shameful god Baal has taken away all that our ancestors worked for. It has taken away our flocks and our herds and even our sons and daughters. Let us acknowledge our shame. Let us bear the disgrace that we deserve, for we have sinned against the Lord our God, both we and our ancestors. From earliest times to this very day, we have not obeyed the Lord our God. If you, Israel, want to come back, says the Lord, if you want to come back to me, you must get those disgusting idols out of my sight and must no longer go astray. You must be truthful, honest, and upright when you take an oath saying, As surely as the Lord lives, if you do, the nations will pray to be as blessed by him as you are and will make him the object of their boasting. Yes, the Lord has this to say to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Like a farmer breaking up hard, unplowed ground, you must break your rebellious will and make a new beginning. Just as a farmer must clear away thorns, lest the seed is wasted. You must get rid of the sin that is ruining your lives. Just as ritual circumcision cuts away the foreskin as an external symbol of dedicated covenant commitment, you must genuinely dedicate yourselves to the Lord and get rid of everything that hinders your commitment to me people of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. If you do not, my anger will blaze up like a flaming fire against you that no one will be able to extinguish. That will happen because of the evil you have done. The Lord said, Announce this in Judah and proclaim it in Jerusalem. Sound the trumpet throughout the land. Shout out loudly, gather together, let us flee into the fortified cities. Raise a signal flag that tells people to go to Zion. Run for safety. Do not delay. For I am about to bring disaster out of the north. I will bring great destruction. Like a lion that has come up from its lair, the one who destroys nations has set out from his home base. He is coming out to lay your land waste. Your cities will become ruins and lie uninhabited. So put on sackcloth. Mourn and wail, saying, The fierce anger of the Lord has not turned away from us. When this happens, says the Lord, the king and his officials will lose their courage. The priests will be struck with horror, and the prophets will be speechless in astonishment. In response to all this, I said, Ah, Lord God, you have surely allowed the people of Judah and Jerusalem to be deceived by those who say, You will be safe. But in fact, a sword is already at our throats. At that time, the people of Judah and Jerusalem will be told, a scorching wind will sweep down from the hilltops in the desert on my dear people. It will not be a gentle breeze for winnowing the grain and blowing away the chaff. No a wind too strong for that will come at my bidding. Yes, even now I, myself, am calling down judgment on them. Look, the enemy is approaching like gathering clouds. The roar of his chariots is like that of a whirlwind. His horses move more swiftly than eagles. I cry out, we are doomed, for we will be destroyed. O people of Jerusalem, purify your hearts from evil, so that you may yet be delivered. How long will you continue to harbor up wicked schemes within you? For messengers are coming heralding disaster from the city of Dan and from the hills of Ephraim. They are saying, Announce to the surrounding nations, The enemy is coming. Proclaim this message to Jerusalem. Those who besiege cities are coming from a distant land. They are ready to raise the battle cry against the towns in Judah. They will surround Jerusalem like men guarding a field, because they have rebelled against me, says the Lord. The way you have lived and the things you have done will bring this on you. This is the punishment you deserve and it will be painful indeed. The pain will be so bad it will pierce your heart. I said, oh, the feeling in the pit of my stomach. I writhe in anguish, oh, the pain in my heart. My heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent. For I hear the sound of the trumpet. The sound of the battle cry pierces my soul. I see one destruction after another taking place so that the whole land lies in ruins. I see our tents suddenly destroyed. 
their curtains torn down in a mere instant. How long must I see the enemy's battle flags and hear the military signals of their bugles? The Lord answered, This will happen because my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are like children who have no sense. They have no understanding. They are skilled at doing evil. They do not know how to do good. I looked at the land and saw that it was an empty wasteland. I looked up at the sky and its light had vanished. I looked at the mountains and saw that they were shaking. All the hills were swaying back and forth. I looked and saw that there were no more people and that all the birds in the sky had flown away. I looked and saw that the fruitful land had become a desert and that all the cities had been laid in ruins. The Lord had brought this all about because of his blazing anger. All this will happen because the Lord said the whole land will be desolate. However, I will not completely destroy it. Because of this, the land will mourn and the sky above will grow black. For I have made my purpose known and I will not relent or turn back from carrying it out. At the sound of the approaching horsemen and archers, the people of every town will flee. Some of them will hide in the thickets, others will climb up among the rocks. All the cities will be deserted, no one will remain in them. And you, Zion, city doomed to destruction, you accomplish nothing by wearing a beautiful dress, decking yourself out in jewels of gold and putting on eyeshadow. You are making yourself beautiful for nothing. Your lovers spurn you. They want to kill you. In fact, I hear a cry like that of a woman in labor, a cry of anguish like that of a woman giving birth to her first baby. It is a cry of daughter Zion gasping for breath, reaching out for help, saying, I am done in. My life is ebbing away before these murderers. God, sometimes we make a disconnect between us and the Bible. We do this because it seems like when it was written, that time was so long ago that those people couldn't possibly have anything to do with us. And so we discount what is actually being said in there. So in here, when uh, Jeremiah is talking about equating worshiping idols and prostitution, it makes sense, but we're sitting here saying we don't worship idols. We don't have mantles of, of heads or um, totems or different things like that where we worship other gods. We only have one God, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, our Lord and Savior, and his Father, our God. And then if we stop and think about it for a second, or a couple seconds, <laughs> depending upon how much denial we're in, we suddenly realize that Jeremiah could be talking to us in present day America or wherever we are living. What about going out and partying with our friends and coming to church the next day a little bit hungover? Are we worshiping idols? What about going to a movie that has inappropriateness in it? And then heading to Bible study afterwards to talk about God. Are we worshiping idols? What about pursuing a relationship that isn't of you, God? Not only pursuing idols in that relationship, but definitely can make a connection to the prostitution, to the sexual part there. All these things were running to all these other things that were putting in front of you or seeking things from them affirmation identity um, sometimes I identity in the sense of who we are when you've already told us exactly who we are we are yours and yet in maybe a job title uh, or a relationship with a certain person we find our identity in those types of things we receive uh, affirmations from these people as opposed to as opposed from you we run to all these idols and then we run back to you and say, God, God, help me. God, God, save me. God, God, stop disciplining me. I'm trying my best. Well, the whole time we've been running off with all these other lovers, as Jeremiah puts it, running around with them and then coming back to our husband, you, and saying, well, take me back. I, I don't understand the problem here. 
I, I really haven't been doing anything. Uh, maybe sinning, maybe nothing more so than anybody else here uh, in my community does. You know, everybody goes to the movies. Everybody goes and hangs out and has some drinks with some friends. You know, everybody has those relationships where you know he's he or she's not the right person for you, but you know, you're kind of lonely. God, I can't imagine how that must feel to you when we come running back to you as first and foremost acting all innocent. And second, with this full understanding of our personalities just dripping with the smell of all of these other lovers, as Jeremiah puts it, and coming before you, coming before you in prayer, coming before you uh, in church, coming before you in a Bible study, coming before you as we go and tell other people about you. And we just still have that, that scent, that, that aura around us of all of these other things that we have done, all this other sinning and choices of sin that we have have decided to have in our lives over you. God, we can't hide anything from you. You know everything. So there's no possible way that we can hide any of these areas of our lives from you. But one of the things that I do find is we are so numb to acknowledging sin areas of our life. I'm not making excuses. It's just, just what I see over and over again, even in my own life. That sometimes we really need you to clearly spell out that it may not be an intentional sin, but it's definitely one that we are still um, choosing as an idol. And we may not see it. We may not see how much value we're actually giving that particular item. So God, I just ask that you show us those things. Um, intentional or, or ignorant choices uh, that are out there. And you just show us that we are worshiping other idols, that we are... Uh, prostituting ourselves to all of these other things out there possibly people too but basically things and choosing them over you and then running back to you and and begging for all the things you've promised to us god please help us show that show us the things that we don't see so that we can work on those for the things that we do know are idols in our life God, just make that really uncomfortable. I don't know how to be more clear about that. Um, sometimes we so desperately, for a variety of reasons, including selfishness and insecurity, want to hang on to those other idols. And, and our only choice should be you, God. That should be our first choice, our only choice. But sometimes it's not. I, I ask that you give us the strength to make those sometimes really hard choices. It, and it shouldn't be hard. Choosing between a sin, a relationship, a title, money, and you, God, it really shouldn't be a hard decision, but sometimes, in all honesty, it really is. So I do ask for that strength to make those right decisions, and then for your guidance in walking that path away from whatever that situation is, so we can walk closer to you, God, so that you can be the only thing that we admire in our life, the only thing we seek in our life, the only thing that we're passionate, truly passionate about in our life. In your son's name I pray. Amen.